Welcome to the Lights Out Podcast. This is Chris Lights Out Lytle, and this is our journey to document the history of mixed martial arts. I have brought with me my friend, the MMA detective Mike Davis, and together we will preserve the history and hear some great stories from the world in the era of the no-holes book. Thank you and enjoy. Welcome back to the Lights Out MMA History Podcast. I am Joey Venti. I'm with the host of the show. He is the MMA detective, Mike Davis. Our guest today has fought all over the world. He is a veteran of UFC 1. He is a conqueror of ninjas, and he is back on our show for part two of his epic career deep dive. He is nasty Zane Frazier. Zane, thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you guys for having me. Appreciate it. Mr. Frazier, it's our part two with you. Our first one, ladies and gentlemen, we found somebody that can tell a hell of a story and has got some incredible life experiences. And after that, Joey and I talked for about three days going, you know, usually we kind of do time and space in between second interviews. This is officially Zane Frazier week. What's up, buddy? Thanks for joining us, Zane. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. So, Zane, when we left off, I, it was Cal Worsham. That was your second – or the second – Fight. We got through two fights in two hours. No, we didn't. We also got through your Brazil, the World Valley Tudo, where Ma Mastery Hulk, you fell from the ring. They counted as a loss on your record and move him in on a tournament. But shortly after that, there was a crazy incident involving uh, an Australian event on March 22nd, 1997. Before I get into it, why don't we talk about how it was presented to you and what actually took place there? Uh, I was scheduled to fight <clears throat> in that tournament and was presented as UFC Australia. Now, what had happened at that time, the UFC had not trademarked UFC or Ultimate Fighting Championship internationally yet. They had not trademarked it registered. So the UFC Australia was um, their version, or they said, we're going to have UFC in Australia. So that's essentially that was where that was uh, scheduled to happen at that time. By now, by that time, I had joined Team. Now, let me go back for a second. By that time, I had joined the team that was the, the uh, I think he's still to this day, the only undefeated team in the history of the UFC, which is Team Phoenix. That team had uh, Mark Kerr, Mark Coleman, Don Fry, Dan Severn, Tom Erickson. Uh, Michael Van Arsdale, uh, Kevin Jackson was on that team. Uh, let me see who else was on that team. Um, uh, and a whole host of other wrestlers. And that was the team that was undefeated. So after my Brazil fight with Master Hope, which was a setup fight, um, meaning that they didn't, uh, Sergio Bartorelli counted me out because there was a fight that I went to in Brazil prior to that where it turned into a riot when Patrick Smith was fighting Fabio Gagel. Uh, and what happened is um, the rules supposed to be valid Tudo, no rules. And Patrick Smith had an overhook underneath the rope of the rings uh, of the ring. And um, uh, uh, Fabio Gagel had, I believe Fabio was Fabio Gagel, who had a body lock against, was trying to take Patrick Smith down. So Patrick wouldn't let go of the rope and he couldn't take him down. So as a result, all of the American, the place turned into a riot and all the Brazilian people was trying to attack the American fighters and we all had each other's back. And we started, you know, rounding around protecting Patrick and getting into the ring, protecting American fighters. Why that's important is because a lot of those Valley Tudo fights um, were set up for a lot of the Americans to lose because they wanted the Amer they wanted to bring the Americans down, beat the Americans in Brazil. That was what that was about. So when my fight came up with Master Hulk, what they had not known was who Mark Kerr was. And Mark Kerr was a, a bigger version of Mark Coleman. And so they wanted to put, so when Master Hulk, and they didn't have any mats uh, on that ring when I fought Master Hulk. So when he, when we fell out of the ring, they uh, counted me out 
uh, because my head hit the concrete. There was no mats around the ring. Wait, wait, Zane, Zane, let me interrupt here. You were, like, this is not somebody that takes a gentle fall out of the ring. There is no doubt that, like, probably days after that, you were still pretty messed up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had a headache. I guess it could have been concussion. I don't know. I had a headache for a while. Sure. And I was, um, so they uh, counted me. Sergio Bartarelli counted me out and wouldn't let me give me, didn't give me five minutes. They didn't give me anything. They just counted me out and they wanted Master Hulk to win. Well, his next fight was Mark Kerr. And Mark Kerr actually had a tough time taking him down. If you watch my fight with Master Hulk, I kind of took him down pretty easily. You know, as far as, and so that was kind of the thing that they didn't realize, oh, and I had, by, by that time I had been wrestling I figured out this whole jujitsu, wrestling, grappling, catch wrestling stuff. And I kind of figured out which direction to go. And by that time, um, and that was through Mark Schultz and Pedro Sauer after UFC 9, we had had a long conversation of what's better wrestling, jujitsu, or both combination, things like that. So I had, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I had left Arizona, I was, excuse me, I left LA and I was traveling back and forth to Phoenix uh, every other week or every other month just to train with the wrestlers because there wasn't a lot of wrestling in California. A lot of people like to say, oh, California is the mecca of wrestling and grappling and jujitsu. That's not true, especially not at that time. There was only a couple of places that allow you to do grappling. Uh, and wrestling and MMA and Valley, Valley Tudo. People got to realize there were there was no Valley Tudo sparring. There was no Valley Tudo means anything goes. There was no MMA sparring. There was no uh, um, sparring with mixed rules. It was either you box one place, went to another place to do kickboxing and Muay Thai. You went and did your wrestling somewhere else. And then you went and did your grappling or jujitsu if you if they would allow you to train and you had to piece that together in several studios. So that wasn't any sparring. You just went and fought. Okay. You just well, went and fought. Well, well, Zane, let's talk about promoter Randy Babel over at Australia's first MMA event ever. He's an American living in Australia, stealing the UFC name, and you got dragged over there for a twenty five thousand take all tournament. Yes. That was a good tournament. Mar I, I remember who was there. Um, Mario Spiri was there. I was hoping oh, to see. fight him because I was hoping to fight him because he was from Carlos Gracie Jr.'s camp. And that's Bustamante and all those guys. Bustamante, Fabio Gogel, um, uh Victor Belfort was in that group. That whole group was part of that. And I had um, over there, so I was doing condi conditioning training on the beach in the sand and I tore calf muscle um, doing sprint work on the beach on that day. And so we thought it would heal because I was over there for seven days and we thought it would heal by the time. I think I was the first day, day I was there on Monday night. I was doing sprint work that night, wrestling drills in the sand and uh, with Richard Hamilton. Um, he was the corner man and I tore calf muscle that I think it was that night. And they brought the doctor in. They tried to shoot it up, get it to swell up. But I just, it's by the time it swelled up by Wednesday, it was just, I couldn't move on it. Okay. So, that, so that was a good tournament there. The, the change of name, the UFC suing, did you get called by any, any lawyers in regards to participating in it? No, no, nobody called us for that. No one, no one called us for that. Not least I didn't get any calls. Yeah, uh, so the guy, the guy pulled it off too. He pulled it off. I know he lost his ass, but... Um, everybody was there under the guise that it was actually like an actual certified UFC event. And it turns out it was a guy just kind of stealing the name. Well, you got to remember, it goes back. The UFC had not, you got to, people got to forget, for, people got to understand. Horian Gracie by trade is a lawyer. I don't know if people know that. I don't know if you guys knew that. And Horian Gracie trademarked the name Gracie Jiu Jitsu. And he was trying to distinguish Gracie Jiu-Jitsu from Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for a very interesting reason. And he was right about that. At the time that the UFC in Australia was going on, the UFC did not have an international trademark or a um, service mark uh, branding of, well, they had the brand, but they didn't have UFC in Australia. 
So that was not illegal. It may have been, it may have, he may have tried to have other events and he sued him after that, but at that time, it was UFC Australia. And that's what essentially happened at that time. Uh, so it was an actual, it wasn't the UFC from the Bob Meyerowitz or the Gracies, but, you know, from what we thought uh, and what we believe, it was just another UFC event. Now, subsequently after that, um, they really, they I think the UFC received a trademark, I wouldn't believe, and a service mark of using the name UFC in an event. And here's why I can tell you that. I came up with a fighting, uh, an organization that turned out to be what we now see the UFC gym was called Ultimate Fighting Concepts. And that was a gym that was, we created the Ultimate Fighting Alliance, which was an organization that was certified at different martial arts schools that fighters had fought in the UFC so that if somebody wanted to contact a particular martial arts school and say, hey, I want to do that UFC thing, that school would have been what was called an Ultimate Fighting Alliance con uh, studio. That The UFC did not have a trademark for that. They might want to tell you they did, but they didn't. I know because I can show you, this, I can show you the exact patch of what we had and we created it it was called the Ultimate Fighting Alliance. Man, Zane, you were ahead of your time, man. You you saw shit coming before they did. Well, it was history because that's what happened to, to the PKA. If you yeah. go back to look at the PKA, Point Karate was, Association. Right. No, no, pro, no, professional karate. And that was American. Okay. Kick, that, that was American kickboxing, and uh, with the American kickboxing, what they essentially were doing was they were kind of basically slapping the face of everybody who did traditional karate. So when somebody would come and watch kickback full PK on television and you pick up the studio, somebody would say, hey, I want to dial my local studio and see if I could learn that PKA stuff. All the martial, traditional martial arts would hang up. We don't do that crap. That's what they called it. So we had seen that. This is the, we had seen that before. So the idea was why not capitalize on the fact that people are going to see this and start using that to draw students to our school if we've all participated in the UFC. So I gave Art Davey a sample of what it would call a certificate. We kind of created a certificate called Ultimate Fighting Alliance. He would sign it and he would authorize a school to do that so that we can get more students who want to do that type of fighting. So that was kind of the idea behind it. And we created a patch behind it called the Ultimate Fighting Alliance. We created it too. And by that time, I will at least say the Gracies had sold to Bob Marowitz, I believe it was, and Semaphore Entertainment, and they stepped out of it. And then by that time, Bob Marowitz has got involved in it. And after that, uh, it just didn't go nowhere. Because Senator McCain was trying to, so supposedly, so he was trying to crush it. So nobody wanted to take it any further than that. Okay, here, let me ask you, we got a crazy event. Like that Australia event, you didn't participate in. Tons of controversy and stuff like that. You didn't end up fighting in it. We had Elvis Sinisek on, and Elvis said, man, he vouched for you. He's like, man, that guy, he was not faking it. He was legitimately injured. Freak accident. Oh, yeah. On, no on November 12th, 1997, the first absolute fighting championship takes place in Tel Aviv. This is Igor Volchenshin's. I think it's his second tournament. Right. His second or third tournament. I don't have it in front of me. But you fought Vasily Kudin that night. Um yeah. In our Nick Nutter interview, he had explained to us that he heard he was supposed to go, never got his plane tickets until the day before. What was your experience like fighting on this card? <laughs> That's a hilarious card. So here's what happened. So <clears throat> this is another thing that the promoter did because we a lot Frederico of us. Frederico Lapenda. Frederico Lapenda is a yeah. promoter. promoter. Fre Frederico Lapenda was a promoter, and Frederico was doing the best he could. He did a, a lot of stuff. That he was trying to promote shows, and he, and I like Frederico a lot. Well, I kind of I liked him a lot. He was a cool guy, but I got burned on a couple of events because by him, because I got flown down to Brazil a couple of times, and I was supposed to fight Pedro um, Sauer in a super fight. And Pedro Sauer or Pedro Hizzo? Pe I'm sorry, Pedro Hizzo. I'm sorry, Pedro okay. Hizzo. I was supposed to pay fight Pedro in a super fight event. I'd fly all the way down to Brazil. It was supposed to be ten thousand dollars to show and ten thousand dollars to win. 
And so essentially what wind up happening, Federico says, hey, Zane, I'll pay you $5,000, um, but I can't have you fight in the show because Pedro Hizzo don't want to fight you. Now, here's why. Myself, Patrick Smith, and Pedro Hizzo have fought in the K-1 a few months earlier. So Pedro didn't want to smoke. So they said he doesn't want to lose in his hometown. So I says, well, why am I down here? I can't get a fight. So Frederico Hadlapinda has had a history of being able to change promotion or fly you out somewhere and not pay you. And he had a, he had a history of being able to set up odds against you so you lose. So that fight, when I flow from L.A. to New York, and we had a six-hour layover. And then by the time we got, we, we left from New York City to Tel Aviv, I think it was 17-hour flight, or I think it was 17-hour flight, something like that. We arrived that Sunday, Saturday morning, I think it was, Saturday, Sunday morning, I can't remember. I want to say it was a Saturday morning because I almost went to prison in Israel for it because we weren't supposed to fight on a, on a Sunday. And they, and they opened my suitcases, the, the, the IDF police, and they asked me, they looked at my passport, they brought me in for questioning, and they says, uh, we have a problem. We don't think that you are, why are you coming to Israel? And I said, oh, I'm coming to um, see the sites. And he goes, well, according to your plane ticket and your passport, you're, you just recently got a passport to go to Israel. And your plane ticket that has you leaving Israel tomorrow. Nobody comes to Israel for two days and leaves. So they held me in questioning. By the time I got out and by the time I could get to the fight, I hadn't had any sleep. So I'm on a flight. I'm on a flight from L.A. to New York. Wait, wait. How soon before did you actually get your plane ticket? I got my plane ticket. I got my plane ticket. Um... I got my plane ticket. I can't remember when I got my plane. I can't remember that. I can't remember, but I want to say I got my plane ticket, plane ticket, probably a couple of days or a few days before. Cause again, Frederico Lapinda would try to put these shows on. And a lot of times he didn't have the money right away. Yeah. So he didn't have their money right away. So you don't know when you're going to get the plane ticket, but we were trying to train for it. And so essentially by the time I finally got my plane ticket, I said, I want to got, we left, I want to say we left on a Thursday. No, I was, I was in New York on Friday. So we left Thursday evening, arrive at midnight, something. Because I remember because I always carry a pollo loco chicken just in case I get hungry. And I remember we we're eating, I was sharing my chicken with all the guys. I had like 50 pieces of chicken so I was because we couldn't eat because all the restaurants were closed in, in JFK or I think it was JFK that we were in. So by the time we flew, flew out, it was something like, you know, uh, 6 a.m. that next morning because we had a six-hour layover or something like that. And by the time we got to Israel, the fight was in six hours. I was in interrogation for three. Wow. So, by, so by, the time, by the time I get into Israel, by the time they go get me through customs, by the time they hold my passport and all my gear for three hours because I told them I was just in sightseeing. They found gloves, they found ropes, and they found a fight poster. And they told me that if you fight and you get caught fighting this fight, we will send you to prison. So I told them I wasn't fighting. I was just being a spectator. I was just going to work out. And so long story short, by the time they, I got out of customs and got to the airport, I literally got to the arena, went to the event, Hadn't had anything eat since the chicken in New York, but that's 17 hours ago. And then by, I walked in from, uh, 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 from, the, from the bus that got us there, walked into the arena. I think there was a fight before me, and I was up next. That's, Frederic, that's, the, Frederico Pico, that's the Federico Pindle show. So at the time, I was sleepy. Anybody that's rolling their eyes at this, go listen to our Nick Nutter interview. He tells the exact same story with the exception that he thought the fight was off. Mark Coleman dragged him out of a bar, dropped him off at the airport where he found out he was going alone and he didn't even have a corner. Like Coleman yeah. didn't even tell him. And yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's yeah. wild. Yeah. That's so wild. That, yeah. So I was fighting on fumes. I was fighting on fumes. I was trying to say, I got to get over quick. <laughs> well, but you had also mentioned about Frederico Lependic kind of tilting the table towards certain yeah. people. Yeah, Nick Nutter. I mean, if you watch the Eagle Wolf Tension fight, 
Igor taps in that, and they restart it. Yeah, because oh. so what? So Frederico liked he liked Igor, and he really liked Igor Vikosha because he wanted Igor to beat up a lot of the Gracies. That's what he wanted. A lot of the Brazilians. <laughs> he wanted to beat them up. That was, those were his words. I mean, he can come on and deny me all the time, but that's what he wanted. He that's why he wanted me to fight Pedro Rizzo because he wanted me to beat Pedro up. And so when I went, when I was ready, I was in shape, ready to go. Paul Varlins was on, I think. Paul Varlins was on a second. He was on that show and another show that I was on. I was ready to go. And Frederico um, uh, um, uh, didn't even pay, uh, paid me. And I didn't even go to the event. In fact, I started, I went to a jiu-jitsu studio in Brazil. I didn't even go to the event because I wasn't fighting. So I went to a Brazilian, I went to, finally I could train Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And I went to Fred Rico was now in this way. Fred Rico was very gracious. He paid me as a Zane. I'll give you a return flight whenever you want to go back. I stayed in Brazil for like ten days, and all I did was went to jujitsu studios all day every day because I couldn't get any Brazilian jujitsu training from the Gracies or the Machado brothers. So I started going around all the jujitsu studios I could to study and train with all the guys to understand Brazilian jujitsu, and that's when I found Brazilian jujitsu in Brazil was different than what the Gracies were teaching in America. It was different from what the what the uh, uh, Machado brothers were teaching in America. It was a different style of jiu-jitsu. So people wanted to think that, uh, and they say, well, what's the different style? Well, in Brazil, they were doing jiu-jitsu with strikes. Okay, people forget about this, is that if you go back and look at, you go back and look at Hoist winning all of his fights, which he won, no doubt, we were not initiated. We didn't know about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He won those. He won those fair and square. With the exception of they didn't allow too many wrestlers in the first stage of those fights because they did not want to lose. So what had happened is when we started, when I started going to Brazil, these guys were, I had, there was like 80 guys that school tapping me out with geese on. I go, man, I don't get this stuff. And it was long story short, we wound up wrestling and doing catch wrestling and submission wrestling. And he goes, this is jujitsu too. And I said, wait a minute. I thought jujitsu meant with the gi. That's what I, we were told in America. He goes, no, jujitsu is jujitsu. And this one guy was, um, it was a gym in Sao Paulo. And it was a guy, I forget his name, but his name was Jorge or Georgie. And his nickname was called the monkey. And it was a really good jujitsu guy, a uh, really good jujitsu out of that studio. And it was a converted car dealership with five stories and they had different martial arts on each story, on each floor. Really cool studio. And um, he told me that jujitsu was designed to fight off your back. Anything else fighting from the top was catch wrestling. So when you have, so I said, well, I can wrestle. So I started wrestling and guys, taking guys down and putting, getting position with guys. And then when I put them on their back, that, that's when the jujitsu would kick in. And that made sense to me. So my point with that is, is that when Frederico was trying to set up Igor Vincochi to win, he was setting it up in matches because he wanted him to beat other fighters. He, there was okay. people that Frederico wanted them to beat, and Igor Vincochi was one of them. Okay. Well, here, did you get paid for that event? Yes. Frederico only gave me half of what I was supposed to get. He gave me five grand. Oh, but I, I'm talking get- about, what about the one in Tel Aviv? Yeah, I did get paid. I got paid. I got paid. Oh, yeah. Heck yeah. I got paid a lot of money in Tel Aviv. And here's why. Because he was out paying the UFC at this point as well. Like he was paying higher than the UFC. Was. Oh, yeah. He was. He was a hey, listen. So now here's the good stuff about Frederico. The hardest part about Frederico Lapinda when he pays you is if you can get that cash back through customs in America. That is the hard part with Frederico. And so I'm thinking, how am I going to get this money back to customs? How am I going to, can I put it in a bank account and draw it from Israel or Brazil? We didn't have time for that. Could I wire it back? So that was the thing. He paid extremely well. He he did. Yeah, he did pay well. And oh, yeah. um, when he didn't pay, there was issues. But when he did pay, it was like, oh, my God. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, there was a time I fought for Frederico. I stepped off the airplane, came through custom. He put a thousand dollars in your hand right out of the gate. Boom. And I'm talking Chris one hundred dollar bills too. Hey, dude, I respect him, man. <laughs> it, especially yeah. at this time. At this time, I respect him, Joey. Yeah. You got something? 
Yeah, I just got a question. For the Tel Aviv fight, um, Joe Charles is on the card. I know you guys don't live too far from each other. Were you guys training together for this event? So when I, I met Joe Charles through um, Bernie Krasno and through Gokar. And so what had happened was Joe Charles and I had started to train together. And um, uh, when Joe Charles and I started to train together, that's when we started to figure out, okay, how do we do this? Because Joe Charles was a good judo guy. He was a big, strong judo guy. He was a good judo guy. He was a good body to wrestle with. But here was the thing. We were training at Gold Car Studio. So when Joe and I wanted to go from punch, kick, ground to grapple like Valley Tudor or MMA sparring, no one would allow it. So Joe and I had to kind of figure out how to spar like a Valley Tudor fight with, with no rules because the only person that we know, there's only three people we know that, maybe four people we know that was doing that kind of training. Uh, and this is before Tank Abbott was doing it. Uh, you had Eric Paulson was doing it for sure, but they had rules in shoot wrestling. You had Matt Hume that was doing it up in Seattle. Uh, definitely you always knew the Gracies were doing that. Um, and so the only other person that was doing that was Richard Hamilton because he had body armor for everybody to wear so you can go all out like a real fight in the MMA or UFC. That makes a difference. When you're trying to piece together your MMA sparring, you're doing wrestling at this studio. You, you, you can't, you're, you're fragmenting together. So Joe and I was trying to figure out how can we spar and do Valley Tudor fighting to get prepared for the fights. And Gokar didn't allow it. Uh, 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 nobody else allowed it, allowed that kind of sparring to do it. I even went over to um, Carlos Gracie Jr. studio that was ran by Victor Belfort. Victor Belfort said, told me straight out, I said, hey, can I do Valley Tudo sparring with you? And he goes, and he goes, you fought in Brazil? I go, yeah, because we didn't know each other. He goes, he goes, only person that's Valley Tudo is me. I said, well, you have, can I meet with you and train with you Valley Tudo? He goes, no, they didn't want the Valley Tudo sparring out. So when Joe Charles and I had figured out, I think this is the secret, Joe, because I get caught up on it. I get caught up on the transition from going from punching, kicking, striking, to, 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 to clinch work, to pummel, blah, blah, blah. And then Joe goes, yeah, well, I can't get the punch and kicking down. So we were trying to put that together. And lo and behold, we, when we figured it out, nobody, we had no place to go train at that train like that. Gotcha. Well, I, at that point, Joey, I believe the only American training with them and allowed to do that was Todd Medina. Yeah. That's Todd, true. Todd, Todd Medina was doing that. He had to go to Orange County for that, but still those guys were under Brazilian jiu-jitsu. They were learning Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Hicks and Gracie had put out the word that you can't train anywhere. You had to get, you can't do Valley Tudo sparring or anything like that without Hicks and Gracie's permission. I know that for a fact because of the guy named Ken Gableson, who would had heavyweights, who was doing sparring like that. I went down to Ken Gableson because where Todd Medina had referred me to go see Ken Gableson. I went to Ken Gableson's studio. I put, um, they wanted um, $200 a month. I put $600 cash on the table. He called Hicks and Gracie to ask Hicks and Gracie's permission. Right there when I was standing there, Hicks and Gracie said, no, you can't train Zane Frazier for that. So Todd was doing it, but they didn't let a lot of other people in that circle because it was a jujitsu product. So Zane, T Todd Medina, one of our better interviews this entire year, he gave us yeah. a hell of an interview. But Zane also is a byproduct of that. Are you aware that Todd Medina is not listed as a Carlson Gracie senior as a black belt, even though it was given to him? So there was also like he was almost punished for being there. He, he's legitimately the first American black belt by Carlson Gracie is Todd Medina, yeah. but he's not recognized. Well, a lot of that you got to keep in mind. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, you got to keep in mind. A lot of the, remember, the Gracie family, and I remember this because I was good friends with Bob Wall, the late Bob Wall, entered the Dragon Bob Wall. Okay. I used, to, I used to do grappling with Bob Wall all the time at Gene LaBelle's. Bob Wall connected me to the Machado brothers. <coughs> Excuse me, the Machado brothers. The Machado brothers were the only other people outside the Gracies who could teach Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. 
And essentially what happened is they changed their name from Gracie Jiu-Jitsu to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And here's why. <coughs> in order to be, excuse me, to order to be considered a Gracie Jiu-Jitsu black belt, you have to do Valley Tudo. That's how the rules were back then. And if you didn't have Valley Tudo in it, you weren't a black belt because that's what those guys were. That was Bustamante, all of those guys that came out of that studio, they were all Valley Tudo fighters. <coughs> excuse me, if you go back and look at, excuse me, if you go back and look at the Grace in Action tape, that those fights take place in 1990, 89, 1991, because the tape came out, <clears throat> excuse me, the tape came out in 92. So you look at those guys fighting, they were fighting long before that. So in order to be a Carlson Gracie black belt, you have to do Valley Tudo. Yeah. And I don't know mm -hmm. if they let I don't know if they let Todd do Valley Tudo. He may have been a Gracie, he may have got his black belt training, but I don't know if they let him if they included the Valley Tudo in there as well. Well, I mean yeah, he's, he's got his black belt here. Let's talk about possible mafia interactions involving that of yourself. February 7th, 1999, Rings Holland. Dick Vry is your opponent. This is the height of the Dutch mafia kind of involvement. I shouldn't say kind of involvement within combat sports. It's kind of their transition over to mixed martial arts from kickboxing. What was your experience over there like? Oh, um, I was excited about that fight because I was ready. But again, a lot of times what they did was, um, um, and again, again with with that fight, I felt good about it, and I felt what what part I felt good about was by my grappling part. But again, I had no training for that fight. What I mean by that, people say, <clears throat> "What do you mean you had no training?" Those guys in Holland had figured, those guys in Holland, um, when you talk about all those guys, whether from Ramon Decker, um, Ernesto Hoos, all of those guys, Tom Herrick, all that whole crew, those guys had been one step ahead of Americans when it came to Muay Thai, Dutch kickboxing, and now Valley Tudo sparring, right? <laughs> well, well, Zane, let, let, let me just, so people can kind of understand every country kind of had their own rule set. So, and it always favored the country. Like in Brazil, you know, they wanted you on the ground. Well, in Holland, they gave you 30 seconds of ground. Their MMA consisted of 30 seconds on the ground, and then they would stand you up. And sometimes you can even do rope escapes by grabbing the rope just to get it back on your feet. Yeah, and that's what they essentially did. So what they would do, when I took Dick down, because now you can tell I'm getting better at that, kind of figuring this stuff out. And so I took him down mounted him and all he did was cover up and they don't give you time to work down there. So if you're used to, if I'm coming from LA, the States and I'm used to finally figuring out how to work down there and soften a guy up and do what the Gracie's were doing, which was laying, sitting on top of you <clears throat> and pounding you down to create an opening for submission. That's what your training would consist of. Theirs weren't. And so they made you stand back up every 30 seconds. And so, uh, <clears throat> again, uh, I got gassed a lot. I, I gassed a lot because I didn't, like I said, I was trying to, every fight that I had, my sparring came from the actual fight. I never, I just, I would punch one place, kickbox one place, try to grapple where I could because there was no grappling or wrestling in California at the time. Uh, the shoot wrestling guys over Eric Paulson, Eric, with Eric, they had great guys, but they had no heavyweights. And the other thing you got to remember, <clears throat> Shoot wrestling was designed as a martial art, uh, as a combat sport martial arts, and you didn't have a lot of guys that were pro fighters. You had a lot of guys who were training in the discipline. When you go to what you see now, MMA schools, or, or places where fighters were actually fighting, um, I think I would like to say Todd Medina, the guys in Orange County, were the first guys to start saying, "Tank Abbott, all those guys, let's put together bodies together, and let's just start banging like we like you have to do in the fight," and that made a difference. And when I fought Dick, I was in there. I was ready. At least I thought I was. And I just got juice, man. I got gas. I just got gassed out. <coughs> Excuse me. Say again. I can't hear you. Bodybuilder Rich Piana. He passed away. 
Um, oh, good, good friend of mine. Okay. Yeah, Rich was a good buddy of mine. I heard you two almost fought a couple times. I beat Rich up. <laughs> I can I can lie to you. I'm, I, I beat Rich up. Rich, and if you look at if you look at, I knew Rich. I knew Rich from Gold's Gym, North Hollywood. And he was a big muscular guy. Now keep in mind. Now as time goes on, <clears throat> I started learn. I started. I, I found a place. Uh, that I was wrestling with down in Cerritos College where a lot of big, strong guys were wrestlers, football players kind of thing, or wrestlers slash ex-football players. You know, a lot of uh, wrestlers were either football players and turned to wrestling. So I was starting to get used to the big bodies. By this time, I had already had experience with Mark Kerr, working with Mark Kerr. So now I understand, okay, I need to kind of develop a different type of strength component to this. So Rich Pena, I knew him as a bodybuilder at Gold's Gym North Hollywood. So Rich Pena, big muscle, big muscle guy at the time, and he thought he did martial arts. And so he came here. I had a, I had a karate studio. My wife and I had a karate studio in North, uh, on in North Hollywood. So we had fight night. We did exactly. We've had this every before UFC one, and that's how, and, and that's how, we, and that's how we. And that's how we that's how we would um, that's how we would have uh, get our students. So we have fight night costs you 10 bucks a night. You sign a different waiver, <clears throat> excuse me. And you come in and fight. You can say, I want to box, kickbox. Or back then we called it no holes bar. It wasn't called MMA. It was the value tool on no holes bar. And you can do that cup of sparring. So rich came in, wanted to pay the 10 bucks. He wanted to came to 10 bucks and, and train. <clears throat> so I couldn't get to sparring because I had my own martial arts studio. So I said, I'm going to open up fight night so I can get people to come to me so I can at least get Valley Tudor sparring him. That was the trick. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Rich Pinion comes in, pays the 10 bucks, wants to get in, you know, wants to start trying sparring. And I light Rich up. I mean, I beat him up real bad, you know. And um, the next day he came back and said, hey, I want to sign up him for lessons. And then so Rich said, and I started training Rich privately. And we became really good friends. <clears throat> And then I, uh, excuse me, I went to, um, and by this time, I had we had decided, I went back to Arizona again, and I had decided, my wife and I decided that we needed to go, because um, uh, ASU, I met one of the, uh, one of the wrestlers uh, that was at ASU, and um, I had decided, I found out that they would let me wrestle at ASU. The goal was to wrestle on ASU's wrestling team as a, as a, uh, a as a walk-on athlete. And so I was going to work at, because I had one year of eligibility left playing basketball in college, because I didn't play my senior year in college, because I was fighting in martial arts at the University of Idaho. So I was going to use that extra year to walk on to the univer uh, ASU's wrestling team and just be a wrestling uh, a partner for the heavyweights there. And so we came back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then we finally decided to move there. And that's why I told Rich, hey, man, I'm leaving, man. I'm going to go over and uh, join the ASU, a Arizona State Wrestling Team. And uh, that was the last I saw him, saw of him. But we became really good friends. He was a good dude. Hey, everybody says that. Everybody like that I've <laughs> met that, that knew him. I mean, when he was living, they all said he was like a decent human being. I know there's a little controversy in regards to him, but. I mean, it's just kind of the game. It, it, it was a good dude. Like when I started really wanting to get stronger and to start di distinguishing strength from power, a lot of stuff that I learned in the weight room came from Rich Pena. That's he was talking about. Hey, Zane, when you're dealing with these guys, because I showed him that he's everybody seen Mark Kerr. And I said, he goes, Zane, in order to get be like that, you're going to have to do this to do like that. And that's where I learned a lot from Rich about but how to be able to change that. You, you, yeah, you fought some legends in your career coming up. Jason Godsey, in my opinion. Joey, it's Jason. an interview. I know that's an interview that you had requested that we do. Uh, Jason Godsey. Yeah, you fought him in Indianapolis Extreme Challenge 23, April 2nd, 1999. Jason Godsey. Who? Jason Godsey. Jason the Godsey. Indiana Thaw. Let me tell you, Chris Lytle's partner. Jason, Jason, Jason Godsey. Remind me of that fight. I don't even remember that fight. It, it, you know what? Extreme I, Challenge. Yeah, I'm almost positive I was there. I think this was one of my, I think this may have been my first time in May event ever. Uh, it was in 1999. It says you lost by rear naked choke. Um, he took a couple years off and he fought Bobby Hoffman, the bad seed Bobby Hoffman. 
after that? Oh, Jason Godsey. Yeah. Yeah, Jason. Real nice Godsey. guy, man. He's a, he's actually a teacher. He's a he's a teacher right now. Yeah, I do not. Now I remember that fight. I remember that fight. Um and that's when I was I had just trying to get my feet wet with those guys and Richard Hamilton. Now, this is the time cuz I got to Arizona in 97. And so 7 days later, Richard Hamilton calls me and tells me I he can't be my coach anymore. So I'm left to figure this all out again. My wife and I just packed up. We still got the U-Haul in front of our her brother's house. And we just got there. And so I'm trying to piece together my training. <clears throat> and there was no training here, uh, Arizona. Uh, this was long before Bader. This was long before Cain Velasquez. Um, there was long before anyone else. And so I finally found where Mark Kerr and those guys were training by accident. And Mark Kerr in, in invited me over to train with them. And that's where I was able to connect with that group finally. And then I memorized. And the only thing was, I was trying to take fights. I was the only way I was trying to say, we got to keep fights. Because at the time, we're trying to pay the bills. So I was taking fights. And I thought, man, I got it this time. I got this guy. And I want to say, he, did he get me in a rear naked choke? Are you sure it's a rear naked choke? Do we have a it's video of that? The, that's what, what it's listed it. as. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't mean anything. Like, I, I, that's, I, I think I, I didn't it's a fight pass. Yeah. It's on fight. Is it on Fight Pass? This fight is on Fight Pass, and it's a big card. Dave Manet, Dave Strasser, Shoney Carter, David, David Dodd, dude, this, David Dodd, Armbar, Jeff Monson. Yeah, David Dodd, Armbar's met uh, Jeff Monson on that card. Yeah, it's a big card. Damn, damn, what? And this was where Indiana, Indianapolis, bro. Yep. Indianapolis. I fought on that card. I don't even remember being in Indianapolis. Here, here. Bobby Hoffman is a big personality. Somebody mm -hmm. that. Uh, is no stranger to street fighting. What, what was it like squaring up with him, weigh-ins, any pre-fight issues? No, Bobby Hoffman, I was, I, again, I kept thinking, it's interesting because what I, what I, when I look back at my, all the fights that I had, I look at that I would go to fights by myself. There's no corner man. There's no nothing. There's no, like that. And so I didn't, wasn't wa warmed up properly in this. And that was, and I remember the Bobby Hoffman fight because I want to say, it was on rings, I believe it was. It was on rings. You and, USA. Yeah. Yeah, it was rings USA. And I thought, I'm gonna light this dude up. I'm gonna light this dude up because I felt that I could do that. And um and I a lot of times I, I, I remember second guessing myself in that fight because I lit him up with a, a flurry uh of punches and then he dazed a little bit and I backed off of him. And I remember we get into a body, he locks me up in a body clinch. And, and I, and again, I was, and during this time, I was trying to work around my exercise induced asthma because you got to remember, um, uh, going to these fights alone. The last thing I wanted to do was almost have an episode like I had in UFC one where I almost died in the ring, <clears throat> excuse me, died after UFC one because I went into respiratory failure. So in that fight, I remember breathing heavy. I started wheezing. And I says, oh, man, I'm, I got to figure this out. And then truth be told, I just kind of, I didn't even, I just was trying to hopefully let my asthma subside. Next thing I know, we get on the ground. He's got me ground upon. He's not really hurt me per se. And um, uh, I wind up giving him the arm to try to sacrifice the arm. And he put me in an arm bar, I think it was. Yeah. It was an arm yeah. bar. I think it was an arm yeah. bar. I think it was an arm bar. Straight arm bar, yes. Yeah, straight yeah, arm bar. He, he, if you look at some of Bobby Hoffman's post fight interviews, you can see that there's some there's some issues there. Yeah. <laughs> like he's he's now he's not one afraid not to spend a weekend in jail. That's that's the impression I get. Well, a lot of guys, so a lot of guys, and it was funny because I remember being backstage, there was a guy, a fighter whose name, because Monty Cox was a, the promoter of that fight, if I recall. Monty managed him as well. Oh, Monty managed him. That's what it was. Yeah. And so, um, Monty Cox, um, Monty Cox was disappointed me that he was right to be, but there was a guy in the in the in the in the room. His name was nickname was Meat Truck. I can't remember his first. Carrie Shaw. Carrie Shaw. Yes. 
Kerry Shaw, okay. So Kerry Shaw said, hey, Zane, will you warm me up? And I said, okay. So we're going hard, and we're going this and that, and I'm I'm giving it to him. I'm giving this. And, and Monty Cox is where, coming in the room. He's watching me. He goes, he goes, Zane, where the F was that with Bobby Hoffman? That's what I expected. And it was kind of one of those things that I just – you know, wasn't sure of myself at that time. Wasn't sure if I was ready, uh, <clears throat> coaching myself, training myself, showing up to the fight for myself. And you just kind of didn't have the proper warm up. Didn't have none of that. So I was thinking, and that's when I kind of figured out. You know what? I'm. I have come to the point that I know that I'm better than I am. I'm just not showing it in the ring. And that was a. Uh, that was. That that moment that I wish I had back with Bobby Hoffman, because I'd have beat Bobby Hoffman up. Because everybody thinks they're a street fighter until they come against a real street fighter. You know what I mean? And so I knew Bobby Hoffman, he was trying to play himself with a tough guy. I, I was I had that that Mike Tyson mentality that says, You're not the killer that you think you are. Uh um, you haven't been where I have been. Yeah, jail is one thing, that's because you got caught fighting in the street. <laughs> That's what I do. And so long story short, I kind of, I felt bad about that fight because Monty Cox is saying you could have won that fight. Now he was representing Bobby Hoffman. He goes, you could have won that fight. And I go, what's going on with you? I said, Bob, I said, I got no corner, man. I got no coach. I got no warm up. I got no, no foundation, no support I, system. I, I got, I, I'm training myself. I'm coming out here by myself, uh, warming myself up and trying to get myself ready. And this guy's got Matt Hughes and all a bunch of other guys that's, you know, in his corner, not to make an excuse about that, it was like, it was just tough trying to get somebody to, hey, man, can you hold mitts for me? Oh, man, I got to get my fighter ready. And that was kind of how they, and that's kind of what happened to me uh, is I've never had a coach or I never had a manager. The last coach I ha had was in the UFC 1-9, and, nine, and, and, and and there was a, there was some controversy there because all the coaches were mad at each other. And it was just, it was just ridiculous because everybody was trying to, I put Zane in the UFC while well, I'm coaching Zane, I'm training Zane. And I just got to the point where uh, I never had a coach or a manager. And the only one I ever had was Richard Hamilton. And so it was and just when, and in our first interview, we talked about him and he turned out to be a real bad guy. Yeah. He was a bad guy, but here's what I can tell you from a coach standpoint, he was excellent from a coaching standpoint and a knowledge of this MMA. He, at some point in time, he had figured out how to train like this. And that's what I believe that where you look at Fry, Don Fry, Coleman, I mean, I know they have their controversy with it, but the the the, the fact that Richard Hamilton had 10 headgears, face saver headgears now, chest protectors, body armor, and those guys are going full on in the training room in a room that was at a church, by the way, which had a huge gym facilities in it. North Phoenix Baptist Church off of Bethany Home in Phoenix. That's where that gym was. And so Richard Hamilton had the, he had the right place. He had the wrestlers. He had everything they needed. So from a coaching standpoint, he understood how to win at the UFC and he had facilitated that. Unfortunately, he just had, he, he had other issues and we just couldn't, he just couldn't, you know, by the time he uh, was that, he was all, he was already he was on the run. He was, he got arrested and, and we're looking at each other. Hey, who are we going to get to train? How are we going? So I had to figure all this out for myself. Yeah. Witness protection program. All yeah. that. All yeah, yeah, that yeah. noise. That's yeah. some deep shit. Well, whatever happened to that Bobby Hoffman fight certainly showed in King of the Cage, August 4, 2001. He fought giant Ochi Takayuki Okada. <laughs> oh, Giants, yeah. I was at this one. Oh, yeah. were you? <laughs> it was a big card. I went to a lot of King of the Cages. This was oh, a did you? Card. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, wow. Yeah. That was the one. Um, I always liked, um, I'm trying to think of the promoter, Terry. Terry uh, Terry, Trouble Terry, Trouble Terry, 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 Terry Trouble yeah. was always a good guy. And I was trying to, um, Terry had, had was going to put me on, he put me on a lot of cards. And I had, um, I was scheduled to fight, I think it was either Rico Rodriguez because Rico Rodriguez had won the title, and or the not the but the next not the one card but the next card, and he was going to give me a five fight deal. Now, what's important? This is when the UFC goes dark, and King of the Cage has kind of figured out how to promote their shows, and I ruptured my bicep tendon five days before the fight. I had to pull out of that fight, so Terry Terry gave me another shot at it, and um, um, and uh, the fight at that, and. Um, that was kind of where I was starting again 
started to kind of, I've kind of figured out how to train myself for the show. I had no coach in the background. I had a boxing guy, but for the most part, I started to figure out how to kind of do that. I think it was a one, one round. I think it was a seven minute round, something like mm-hmm. that. And um, I was starting to do that and uh, starting to figure out how to put the stand up and the wrestling and the grappling, finally put some size on, uh, finally fought. I think I fought that fight, 200, 285, kind of figured that out. Wow. Yeah, I started when I went from like 230 to 285 and started doing that, putting it in that, and started, you know, really, lit. and again, there's Rich Pena background there. And he just taught me how to just, you know, uh, Rich, Rich told me the reps never change, only the weight does. And that's how you put stronger size on. And so that's all I did. So I I was ready for that one. Uh, Giant Little Child was kind of going to be like my coming out party of that, being it was okay now, figured it out. Now, now in Arizona, I think Arizona Combat Sports is around. Some other people are doing MMA, and so there's starting to be a little bit more training partners for heavyweights and stuff like that. But for the most part, um, there wasn't a lot of there wasn't a lot of training back in those days. One thing worth mentioning about Giant Ochi is he won his next three fights, and all three were in Pride. Yeah, so he was fighting at a pretty high level. Like that's a good mm-hmm. win. Yeah, no, it's no, no. Jane Ochi is legit, man. Like a lot of those Japanese guys have got beat up records, but you look who they're fighting, and like what weight class it may or may not be in. Like, dude, you got a five hundred record in Pancrase, you're probably a friggin' excellent upper level MMA yeah. fighter. Yeah, at that 100%. time, legitimately, yeah. legitimately. Yeah. Um, Mark Smith. Mark Smith comes with a little bit of controversy as well. Um, he and Ken Shamrock had their issues. Um, there's a rumor that uh, the UFC paid him to take a dive against Don Fry, so Don Fry could get into the finals against Tank Abbott, um, like all nice and fresh. What, what was your interaction like with Mark Smith outside of fighting? That's that's Mark Hall. Mark Smith is Mark oh. the Bear Smith. He's a big 280 pound guy. Yeah, I was Tell gonna me. say I. Yeah, yeah I this, what Mark. Do. this is what we're gonna do. This is where it gets edited. All right, I, I'm going to a wedding in about ten minutes. You're uh, allowed I, to I mean, get one just, wrong every yeah. every episode. Just one. That's your one. Go. <sighs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, boss Rudin guy, and again, I came in that fight with an injury. Um, um, that was I re-injured my calf again. Um, um, again, a lot of my training became was experimental, and I was training while I was getting right, and so. I couldn't um, couldn't push off on that back foot, and uh, I remember again nobody to wrestle with, nobody to grab. Now by this time, um, Kerr is I, I'm not training with Mark Kerr on a regular basis. A lot of other guys is kind of scattered. Don Fry, I think is in Syria. All these guys I was trying to move to Arizona to train with, they all scattered because I think if I recall right around that time they had joined Raw. Uh, Real American Wrestling. They all joined the team. They all kind of scattered. Tom Erickson scattered. So I'm trying to find heavyweights and train because Mark Smith, I think, was about 290 pounds. And I think he, I was trying- he, He's also one of Marco, who was his main training partners, I believe, really? at this time. Who? Who's training I, partner? I, 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 Marco, who was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was trained. He was trained Marco was, but he was a boss rooting guy. He trained for boss rooting. But they all train together. I mean, yeah. who us and Rutten, they were out of the same gym. Yeah. Whoever they used jiu at this time. Yeah, and, and that's why and Boss Rudin and Boss Rudin was a good tra- it was a great trainer too. Because Boss Rudin, Mark Kerr, those guys. So so Mark Kerr was had just got either if either he had just lost to Vigor or got knocked out. And Mark Trump, Kerr was traveling to back to California to train with Boss Rudin. <clears throat> so that was the only training partner I had was Mark Kerr. So when Mark was going back and forth to California didn't have anybody to train with. So when this fight came up with Mark Smith, um, big strong guy. Um, I remember I remember Larry Landis was there, and I remember getting taken down. And Mark got me. I thought I could get, and this is kind of where I, I tell people about the Gracie Jiu Jitsu stuff. Um, uh, it doesn't work when somebody's throwing punches on you, or back then that kind of Jiu Jitsu now it's evolved to where we kind of everybody's figured out how to get out of those bad positions. Um, but for the most part, I remember him taking me down. It was, I thought, okay, it'll take me down, get back up. But he was a strong dude, man. I couldn't get out of that, man. And I remember saying to myself, oh shit, I'm in trouble now. I says, well, 
let me just uh, let me sit down here. And again, no lack of training, um, and um, uh, no, no, you know, not making excuses again, but just nobody to train with. And so I took these fights, just thinking, well, let me use the fight for experience and so forth and so on. And that's when Chuck Liddell later on told me to stop taking fights like that. Um, uh, and John Hackman, I started to finally, I went to Chuck Liddell and John Hackman. I said, I need you to manage me. I need a coach. I'm coming back to Fourth California from Arizona, and that's to say I agreed. He said because you can't keep taking losses like that day without training. So long story short, Mark Smith, uh, I remember Larry Landers saying, "You're right." I said, I'm, "I said, Larry, I'm fine. I'm getting my ass whipped down here because I didn't train, but it's okay." And he goes, "Zane, if you don't if you don't defend yourself, I gotta um, stop." And I go, "I'm gonna stay down here for a little while." And then so Mark was hammering, hammering, and he won. Larry wound up stopping the fight, and then he got up, shook his hand. It was very respectful. I understood it. I accepted the loss uh, as part of that, and uh, I said, "Okay, now I know what not to do next time." So, Joey, you and I, after our first interview, we had a powwow about Zane. You also had a real interesting want in regards to insight. We Okay, we glossed over this on part one, but you mentioned that in a World Karate Championship, you met up with Harold Howard. And I want to detail on that. What what was it like fighting that guy? Because that's a character, one of our favorite guys to talk about here. 100%. I like Harold. So you got to remember Harold. I think was Harold from where was Harold from Chicago, Detroit, Canada, Canada. 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 He was Canada. They, okay, he was from Canada. saying up there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we fought in the Lama Nationals. There was a time where the National Karate League or National Karate Conference had put to put together a series of black belt tournaments, and they were going to try to make professional karate. A, a, a black belt league, you know, for black belts only, get away from the kids' division, the kata and stuff like that. And so I fought uh, Harold Howard in the, and for the heavyweight uh, first and second place in uh, the Lama Nationals in Chicago. And I want to say that was November of 1987. I'll never forget it because that was the last time I was in Chicago because uh, it was so damn cold up there. I said, I'd never go back. Uh, it was cold up there. That, that wind coming off the... Off the Mich- uh, Lake Michigan? No. Lake Michigan. Yeah, Lake, yeah. It, it, it's no joke. No, that's no it's joke. It's no joke. I understand. My, that's why I discovered Domino's Pizza, because that's the only thing I can do is eat to stay warm. Um, so anyway, I fought Harold, and Harold was a good – see, back in those days in point fighting, um, you, you it was about being first, and you could throw combinations. And a lot of us, because we had done karate, but we had done full contact, which is American kickboxing, we punched in karate tournaments like boxers. Matter of fact, I got it on my Instagram page. I got Alvin Prouder. Um, he's punching. You see that seven punch combination of throws. That's what tournament karate looked like in the eighties. So Harold and I was fighting, and so I hit a guy with a. Uh, I won my match, and um, uh, and I hit a guy with a back fist so hard um, that he passed out. Did knock out. He passed out. He walked back and he passed out. And they were going to disqualify me. And Harold Howard says, "Don't disqualify him." Because it was between because everybody it was a big division. If you ever look at karate tournaments, and what I love about what people don't forget about karate tournaments, unlike MMA today, you don't know who's going to show up, and you don't know how many fights you have to fight to get to first and second place. So you can have great techniques, but everybody's going to figure out what you're doing, and they're going to beat you with some counter technique because you got to fight four, five, six guys down there. So Harold, I fought. So Harold lobbied today. Hey, don't disqualify him. Don't disqualify him. I want to fight this. Dude. So we get into it. So Harold was always in my face. He got in my face. Ooh, you know, he, he did his little Ric Flair kind of thing. That's how he did his rule. Let's go. <laughs> and then so right out of the gate, right out of the gate, I blitzed on Harold and lit him up. Kept lighting him up, lighting him up, lighting him up. Then I hit him. Um, I hit him with a combination because I always do punches and bunches back then. And I hit him with a hook kick and I know it hurt him. And all of a sudden he started to calm down. He got me, he he tried to blitz on me a lot of time, tried to do his cartwheel kick on me a lot of time, didn't make it. And I lit him up. And then finally when it came down to, and then he, they gave him a couple little accelerated points that he barely touched me and he didn't really, I countered it, but they gave him the points. So I think we wound up going to overtime. And it was the next first point to win. And I knew I didn't come all the way to Chicago to lose. So I said, I got to move on this guy first. I faked him and made him flinch. And I just blitzed on him and hit him real hard with a back fist in the face and and, uh, hit him in the nose. And his nose started bleeding. 
and they were going to disqualify me. Harold says, don't disqualify me. It's fair and square. He beat me, hugged me, and I went on to fight for grand champion that night. And Harold, Harold was a tough dude. So I, thought, I always thought that it, when I saw him in the UFC 3, I think it was, I saw, I was rooting for Harold. I, I thought Harold would win that, win that whole thing. Because when, they, when he came in and fought, I forget who he fought. Was it Steve Jenham? No, I can't remember who he Yeah, Jenham, Jenham was in the finals, yeah. Jenham was in the final, and I saw Harold Howard. I says, Harold can fight. Harold right. can Her- Harold can fight. He, dude, he, he had a hell of a punch, yeah. man. Like, you know, he, you know, he had his little gimmick and stuff like that with the sand or the cement bag and, you know, the mullet, the wife beater. The, he connected with Steve Jenham in a way to where most of that locker room might not have gotten up. Yeah, I mean, 100%. He, I mean, Jenna made it. Jenna was a hell of a nail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was real, he was real good. I like I like Harold. Harold was a good dude. I mean, that's what it was when we were fighting in those tournaments back then. We you could people don't realize that the tournament karate was more suited for street fighting than it was within full contact or kickboxing Muay Thai. Everybody thinks Muay Thai is good for street fighting. Some aspects it is, but the other aspect when it's time to cover distance and 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 and, and come at somebody and cover distance and, and put together a blitz or combination like that, tournament karate was designed to fight like that. And Harold was we were all like that at that time. So all you said like you said Harold Howard tried the little flip kick. Is that was he known for that? Is that something he yeah, was? That doing was, in that the was a, yeah, that was that was yeah, that's the Billy Blanks move. That's a Billy Blank started all that. <laughs> Billy okay. Blank started. Billy Billy would hit people. I remember when Billy hit somebody with a first cart, cartwheel kick. It was just like somebody doing a rear naked choke or a triangle choke. Everybody was doing a, a cartwheel kick. And you could pull it off because a lot of times it what it really is, it's an axe kick. So you roll, you do a flip, and you're coming down with an axe kick on the top of the head. Right. So, so what happens is if you get caught with that or an axe kick coming down, you, the tendency is that you bite your tongue because the kick comes down on top of your skull and it, and it, and it hurts, hurts your ears. So if you get caught with a, a cartwheel kick, that would, that would, that would, that would hurt. And a lot of guys get caught with that because you don't see it coming. And that's when you start to see the referee starting to say, you know, okay, we're going to let some of this acrobatic stuff come in. And that's uh, Harold. That was Harold's thing was at, with a cartwheel X kick. Harold was a big, scary guy, but he seemed pretty respectful in the way he would take a loss. Yeah, so Harold was a kind like I said, Harold was a guy. If you beat him, well, here and here's the thing with Harold, and 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 he has all those antics, but he was every bit of that. See, that's what you're see back then. If you were you either were the quiet guy who could fight, or you were the guy who was loud like Harold who could fight, or somewhere in between. So Harold was a guy that he wouldn't be like when I when 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 um uh, when I showed up and they had the tournament, Harold was bouncing around, getting in people's face and doing this Ric Flair. Whoa, I, I got your ass. I got your ass, this and that. And, he, and so you can see a lot of guys were intimidated like that with Harold. Right. And so when he came to me, uh, we almost got into it right before the tournament, guys, and then they broke us up. And he goes, and Harold pointed, did his, um, uh, did his uh, the, you remember the movie in, in, in uh, Bloodsport where the guy, I forget his name, Jackson points at Chong, uh, Chong Lee and says, I got you. That yeah. was Harold's thing. That's ex- <laughs> that was Harold's thing. He would look at you and point you in the face, and he goes, "I got you, right?" And he made it, we. You didn't know who you were going to fight because the way the, the 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 way the bracket was set up. But right. what you knew was what you knew. If you waited on Harold Howard, he was going to be all over you because he was a fir- back then. It was about being first, right. and so if you let Howard get off on you, that's it. And tournament is over quick. Pop, 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 pop. Oh, done. Winner. That's it. Go home. And right. Harold would talk. Terrell would trash talk you too. Get out of here. Get out of here, man. Take that shit back to where you came from. Harold was like that. So you had to get. But when he got his, he took it just like everybody else was. Did you fight him multiple times or just that once? I just fought in Harold that once. Just that one time? Okay. I'm looking at the record. I see another name that jumps out because it's a name that made a lot of news recently for not the right reasons, but you fought Aaron Brink in uh, WEC. Mm. Do you remember that fight? Yeah, I remember that fight. He was a really hot and cold fighter. Like, if you caught him on a good night, he was dangerous. Yeah, so Aaron Brink, and then we've been trying to do a rematch for years. Really? Yeah, we've been trying to do a rematch for years because, again, um, 
trying to put together a team to train for me was very difficult because we had we there was just no place there. And Aaron had a good team. I think he was out of Sacramento, if I was if I recall. I forget where Aaron Brink was out of, but Aaron Brink and I fought. And uh, I forget how that fight ended, but I remember um, we we're going at a lot of times, and he was good boxing. I guess he had good hands. And I forget how that fight that fight wound up the fight um, ended, but I wound up losing that fight to him. And I was like, "Damn it, man!" And it was just like uh, it was just it was just a struggle for me because I'm trying to figure out how to win. But we had some good exchange. He was a good guy. He was a good dude. I think he said he was uh, an actor or something like that, or he was a movie. <laughs> he was. He was an adult film star. That's right. That's what he was. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. I remember that. Yeah, I remember saying, "Don't let that, uh, that, don't let that guy, that, don't let that guy beat you." That guy's out there on TV and said something like right. that. But anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. You 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 go on to fight in the WFC and you get a couple of knockouts in a row over Ron Rump and uh, Melville Calabaco. Calabaco. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll we'll end with those two fights because uh, you're on a bit of a roll right there, winning by first round knockout in both of those. Do you remember anything? Oh yeah. Anything so, so now by the time I get to those fights, and I've had a, I had a lot of injuries. I had ruptured my I had ruptured my bicep tendon, and then 18 months later I had ruptured my Achilles tendon, and I had what 16 polyp. You know what I had was severe nasal polyps. And then finally, there was a doctor that was finally able to do what's called CT navigation to clear that out so I could breathe out of my nose. So when you have asthma and you have nasal polyps, you can't breathe out of your nose. You only have one airway to breathe in and breathe out. That was a lot of my challenges was fighting, was trying to, you know, make enough money to get health insurance just to get myself healthy again. So I finally got healthy at that time period. I was healthy. I was in shape. I was ready to go. Um, uh I had been training with Arizona Combat Sports now. They got some fighters that were fighting in the UFC now. So we getting, I'm getting some work. I'm getting some training in. And then so um, they, I finally get a promoter that said, hey, man, we want to get you in these fights. And we're going to put you, sign you for the fight. Uh, uh, and they were, I think it was, they were Gino Carlucci, Carlucci. Okay. And so Gino Carlucci was putting together a thing. He goes, hey, man, and uh, we're going to put you together and put some fights together and promote you and stuff like that because we want to you know, build this new organization around you. And so um, I get two wins. I, so I'm trying to get back to the UFC. Uh, I had already went up to Chuck Liddell's and came back, got my Achilles tendon fixed, uh, ruptured, trained for that. I got that. I was 40-plus years old, I want to say, 45 or something like that. And that I got my Achilles tendon, uh, my Achilles rupture. That repair was – and I got back in shape in about – the repair took a short period of time, but I got back uh, healthy to train again in about five months and, and 14 days. And Courtney Kuputz, who was a gymnast for the Olympic team, my recovery was um, uh, 22 days faster than hers because she ruptured her Achilles. And wow. I, it, why that's important is because I used her because she went to a doctor in Maryland. I went, found her PT schedule her physical therapy schedule, and I used that, and that's how I was able to get back. So once I finally got back in shape, I'm ready to go. Surgeries are good, ready to go. I got training. I'm in shape. I knocked these two guys out, knocked uh, Ronald Rump out, and that was the first fight back. And then uh, I have a night fight with Melvin Calabaca, fight back. Fought, and then so Mark Kerr gives me a call. And Mark Kerr gives me a call and says, hey, man, you're looking good. You're ready to go, man. This, that. He goes, I can tell you something right now. Phone's going to stop ringing. Why? Ain't nobody want to fight you. Now they see what you, you learn how to wrestle. You learn how to punch. You learn how to kick. You're in shape. You're ready to go. Phone's going to stop ringing. I didn't get another fight. And it looks like it did. It looks like it stopped ringing for a couple of years. It, it, for years and years. And so, and I couldn't, I called the date. I called Joe Silva uh, at least 16 times. Joe Silva, Joe Silva said no. Um, a lot of people don't know a lot of things that happened with me in UFC and the UFC. My my issue with the UFC wasn't was was this. When I got in a fight, when I got in a fight with um I was supposed to fight Maurice Smith in Extreme Challenge uh when he fought Conan Silva. Really? Yes. So people don't know this. So um uh uh John Peretti called me. And says, Zane, I want you to fight. Uh, we want to offer you a fight to fight Maurice Smith. 
um, and, and Extreme Challenge. I go, yeah, I, I love the fight. I've been waiting to fight Maurice Smith for years because Maurice Smith was the number one kickboxing fighter in America. I'd already beat the number one karate fighter in America, which was Nasty Steve Nasty Anderson, uh, which is where I get the, he let me use the name because that was his legal name. And Maurice Smith was next on my list. So what had happened was uh, Art Davey calls me, and after I signed to take the fight with uh, Extreme Challenge, uh, to fight against Marie Smith, Art Davey calls me and tells me, if you fight for Extreme Challenge, you'll never fight in the UFC again. Huh. So what had happened is, so I called John Peretti, and John Peretti tells me, um, John Peretti tells me, um, Zane, uh, they'll never call me again. You're never going to fight for Extreme Challenge again. I'm thinking, okay, no problem. I'll be fighting for the UFC. So right after that fight takes place, Art Davey gets fired and John Peretti becomes the matchmaker of UFC. Yep, that's right. And so what happened was I called John Peretti and John Peretti hung up on me for years. I could never oh. get another fight. I could never get another fight in UFC. So by the time John Peretti is out of there and Joe Silva takes up, years and years have passed by. I couldn't get, a, couldn't get another fight in UFC. So the phone stopped ringing. And so I couldn't get a fight here. I called Monty Cox. Hey, I'll fight. Uh, I was supposed to fight three guys. I was supposed to fight and they got the fight turned down. And I was ready to. Josh Barnett. I was supposed to fight Dan Severn. I was supposed to. I went to fight. I was going to I call Monty Cox. Let me fight uh, Tim Sylvia. And the fight that I got put on the thing was Brock Lesnar first fight in the Coliseum. And they, you were supposed to be on that one, huh? I, I was. I got offered to fight that fight, and, I, and they said, "Yeah, we're gonna put you in Zane with Brock Lesnar." And I said, "I'm a." And at that time, I was ready. Uh, I was in shape, uh, and that fight fell through. They didn't want to fight me, and so that was a lot of things. And I had called Mark Kerr, and by that time, Pride was starting to wind down, and nobody had really connections into Pride. I couldn't get in there, and and I was and I had another. I had a business deal that my wife and I were developed, which is a two hundred fifty million dollar deal. We almost got funded before the. And then the recession uh, uh, hit in 2008. We we lost our funding for that, but for and that was took a lot of our time. But for the most part, I never retired from MMA. The phone stopped ringing. Couldn't get a fight anywhere. Couldn't get a fight in um, Gladiator Challenge. Couldn't get a fight King of the Cage. They would always say, "Hey, we got nobody to fight you. Nobody's going to fight you." And that was been the hard part. And that was the same thing that happened to Tom Erickson. Tom Erickson saying that happened to me. Ain't nobody going to fight you now. Absolutely. What the Lesnar fight was that an offer that was kind of last minute because he was supposed to fight Hungman Choi. Hungman Choi couldn't come over, and he ended up fighting somebody else. But were was that I was the, to you? I, I, I was, was the first. I was the I was the first person that got offered to fight Brock really? Lesnar. Yeah, I said I'll fight Brock Lesnar because I saw him because everybody was talking. He was this big bad wrestler. I said he's not better than Kerr. He ain't better than Coleman. Right. I was. I've been wrestling with Kerr, Ruland Gardner. Um, James Johnson, Michael Van Arsdale, and Cain Velasquez, all these other wrestlers. Brock was, he wasn't Tom Erickson. He wasn't right. all these other guys. So that wasn't going to scare me at all. I mean, that was, uh, I was, I had grown up in that community now. So I wanted to fight him. So I said, hey, Zane, we got you. Shannon Richard put my name. He said, hey, man, we're going to get you to fight Brock Lesnar. And all of a sudden, they saw that fight with, uh, so my wife said, nah, we ain't gonna let you fight now. Nah, they said, Zane, they don't want to fight you. They need Brock to win. They wanted Brock to win. Brock was a big, bad wrestler, but he very much did not like getting hit. So that one could no. have been interesting. Yeah. I mean, like I said, we saw that with whether it was uh, 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 Alistair Overeem, he didn't like to get hit. I told people, Brock don't want to get It's one thing to wrestle, but it's one thing to get somebody lighten you up after, right. you, after they defend your takedown. And that was the one thing that I, if I learned anything I could tell from a lot of the wrestlers, Mark Kerr taught me one of the things on the mindset. And we, there was a drill we did a long time ago that he would take me down repeatedly, repeatedly and force me not to go to my back ever. And that was the one thing that if you did that against a guy like Brock Lesnar, you were in trouble. He's just too big. Right. For sure. So, so anyway, long story short, that's kind of essentially how um, I was supposed to fight them. I was supposed to fight a bunch of other guys and guys back out. I didn't, like I said, had never had any representation other than Richard Hamilton who went to jail for 82 years or got some. Yeah. I think you, I think you just dropped a name. Um, Shannon rich. Is that somebody yeah. you had history with? Did you train with yeah. Shannon rich? Yo, so, Ch so Shannon, so Shannon trained with me when I met Shannon 
and here in Arizona 98, Shannon was coming up, driving up and four from Mount Hood. Uh, uh, he hadn't had any fights yet. Uh, this was 1998. He hadn't had any fights yet. And we were training with all the wrestlers, and we let him into the wrestling community. He wasn't part of the wrestling community. And so right. the wrestling community in Arizona at that time was very close-knit. You had to wrestle. They want, they, there was no jujitsu. They don't, they didn't like jujitsu tonight. It was straight up grappling and, and hard nose wrestling. So we were meeting at, I met Shannon at Gilbert junior high school, uh, with a guy called Joey Job. And we were kind of all the Job family. They got five, they had, the dads got 10 kids, five of them were boys and five of them were, uh, one of the kids, were, they were all wrestlers. So that's yeah. how we started. So I started training with Shannon and I think it was 98, uh, 97, 98, when I'm, uh, 98, 97, 98, I would say late 97, early 98. And so we would train together and, um, uh, um, and he would, then I think he went to Blackwater, a bunch of stuff. And I don't know how Shannon, it was funny because Shannon could get all those fights. Yeah. I mean, I mean, he could, I mean, I was like, Shannon, get me on the card. And a lot of times, a lot of the fights Shannon would try to get me on, he would try to get me on the car with him, you know, like that. Cause there was, again, he was the guy that could get, get a lot of fights. I mean, he, he still does gets a lot of fights. He's so, got 120 fights on his sure dog. And that's not even his whole record. I mean, he's no, got, he's, like, he's got over 200 some fights. I want to say he's over 200. So he's got the most fights in MMA history. Yeah. yeah that is so true. He, was able, he was a guy that could get fights. There's one thing about, so that's where, <clears throat> where Shannon and I, I started, we started collaborating a little bit and say, hey, Zane, he's just saying, I can get you fights. Get in shape, I'll get you fights. So that's how that that's how our relationship has always been to some degree. And then we would start, we would train partners together and we would train together because we were the, we were kind of considered the outcasts because we weren't part of any MMA studio because what I felt was no disrespect to a lot of guys. Today it's different because it's 26 years later. 20 years later, guys got a lot more experience. But back then, in the late 90s, a lot of these guys went MMA gyms, never had any fights. Right. Uh, they never had any kickboxing, Muay Thai fights, but they were opening up gyms trying to train the younger generation for MMA. So when we would go into the gym and spar with these guys, we beat them up. And hey, man, you got to leave our gym. Why? Well, these guys are green. You can't beat up our guys. So Shannon and I would piece together our training together. We kind of piece together our training, so we kind of band together like that. Last question, then I'm going to wrap it up before our wives get mad at us. But your last fight is in 2008 at a card called Heavy Hands. You shared a card with Don Fry. Now, Don Fry is from Arizona. Do you have any experience with Don Fry? No, I, I met I, I met Don a couple of times, and I've always liked Don. Don was a great guy. And, and you're talking about that was UFC 9? No, this was uh, it was called Heavy Hands. In, uh, no Limits Fighting. It was in Dallas, Texas. It's your last fight on record, and the main event yeah. happened to be Don Fry. So I was just curious if you had trained with him at all since you spent so much time in Arizona. So Don Fry had moved to Sierra Vista, and I want to say Von Don might have been a firefighter at this time. And he was traveling a lot to go to Japan and for pro wrestling. And by that time, I couldn't get down to Sierra Madre. And I think Don had some injuries when I was trying to get to train with him. Um, but we would see each other, whether it be – um, in passing, because ASU would do uh, MMA night for all of the wrestlers who were part of the MMA program who came through ASU wrestling, and I was I was I was um, invited to be part of that because I was part of that that um, that culture and that 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 program, and that's when I would see Don Fry and Dan Severn, but I never got a chance to train with Don. I'm a lifelong wrestler myself, so one thing I know is ASU wrestling is absolutely legit. I mean, it's yeah. one of the – on the western side of the United States, it's one of the best programs. How old were you when you decided you were going to go redshirt with this top-notch Division One team? So I had to be – that was after UFC 9. So UFC 9, I was in 96, so I had to be like 33, 34. So I was like wow. 35 years old. So I started the MMA program, what's called the MMA wrestling program at ASU. They had, a, they had, and, and, and here's what that means. Um, um, the, the owner of that, Joe Montori, Joe didn't like MMA. So what had happened was because I would, I was trying to become a wrestler and I, and I couldn't, my credits didn't transfer over from the university of Idaho. And then they wanted me to pay tuition, um, to be a walk-on and it was something I had the minimum to take something like 
six credits or something to get on the USC, uh, the, to be able to own a practice squad. And it was like $1,500 a credit. My wife said, man, we can't afford that just for wrestling. Right. So I would go down to the ASU wrestling room. And at the time, Pat Smith was the coach. And I'd bring this heavy, I'd bring this wrestling dummy down because I wouldn't have anybody to practice with a lot of times and a timer, a TV with all these wrestling tapes I'd study. And I would go down there and train and whatnot. And the wrestling room was open 24 hours. So Aaron Simpson, uh, I still call him coach this day. He was down there wrestling a lot. And when it was 5.01, that's when ASU wrestling practice was over. So I said, hey, coach, hey, coach, it's 501. Can I get on the mat? And he would say, wait a minute, Zayn. Hey, coach, it's 502. Can I get on the mat? So I was trying to do that, right? And so I was in there. So I finally got a chance to wrestle and drilling and drilling and conditioning. And then a friend of mine who wrestled at Minnesota named Greg Evans, he was good friends with Melvin Douglas. And he, got, he convinced Melvin Douglas he was a guy who sponsored me and he um, had Melvin come out and train me privately. So I trained with Melvin Douglas about five days a week, three hours a day um, uh, for seven years. Wow. And, and I, so I would drill with Melvin all the day. And that's kind of where my wrestling started to pick up differently because Melvin taught me how Olympic wrestling and, and folk wrestling and college wrestling are different. And so right. I started to learn how to, use wrestling as an offense. And so I was trained with Melvin and that's how my wrestling changed from not night and day while I was trained with Melvin. So I was there. So when I started, to, and matter of fact, what I did was in my years and keep in mind, this is something else I said, when Ron Van Cliff fought Hoist Grace in 94, I knew right. And I sparred with Ron Van Cliff in New York in the late eighties. And I knew Ron Cliff was a uh, Van Cliff. I had sparred with him and I knew he didn't know what he was getting to when he was fighting Hoist. It was night, December 6th, 1994, and at UFC when I decided to make my comeback. And the reason, and that was only after you, after one year after UFC won, and here's why. Because I, my martial arts instructor had told me, he says, it takes 20 years to master one discipline. And I knew it was going to take 20 years to master rest, uh, uh, MMA. So what I, part I needed to do, I need to get to the wrestling part of it. So there was a time when I finally moved to Arizona, I stopped boxing, kickboxing. I threw no strikes for three and a half years. All I did was wrestle for three and a half years every day, all day. I had, wow. I had, I had seven hour practices a day. I would train with Melvin for two and a half, three hours, do my personal training, do all my clients, teach my boxing classes. And I go back because I had a key to a lot of the wrestling rooms in Arizona. And ASU wrestling room was open 24 hours. So I would be able to go in there and wrestle and then I met a guy named James Johnson, the late James Johnson, who was a Greco-Roman coach for the USA team. He was um, uh, for the US Olympic team. He was here and he had taught me how to do uh, Greco-Roman wrestling. And he had me do a conditioning drill because I watched Mark, uh, conditioning he had Michael Van Arsdale do. And I watched Michael Van Arsdale because there was a time I, I, I pulled a hamstring, uh, thought I tore it from the bone. And I was, I was supposed to have, it was myself, um, Mark Kerr, Mark Coleman, and Ruland Gardner were all in Highland High School, and I was the fourth. Wow. I, pulled, I pulled my high, my hamstring earlier that morning doing sprint work, so I couldn't run. I couldn't wrestle that day, so I went there to watch, and I watched all of those guys wrestle, and I watched Michael Van Arsdale, Mark Kerr wrestle for 35 minutes, and Mark Kerr couldn't take Marco Van Arsdale down, and I couldn't understand how he did that, and so I went to James Johnson because that's where. Uh, um, uh, Van Arsdale had trained. It was a drill that he had me do, which is monster walks around the entire track at ASU. He What's says, a monster walk? So that you know, you get down in a squat position, like say you're in a wrestling position, like a defense yeah. wrestling position, and you step slowly, one step at a time, step, step, step. You know, like you know, monster gotcha. walk. You get a, like a, like a squat, but you see like a lot of women do them for like glute work. But right, you stay right. in a low stance and you step one time, one step at a time. It's called monster walks, and your palms are facing up. So James Johnson told me, he says, when you can do that, when you can do that, because I told him I wouldn't learn how to Greco or Rome rest of the because Alexander Corellin was his training partner. When he would come in, he would wrestle with Alexander Corellin when Alexander Corellin would come to the States. Wow. So James Johnson would say, um, if you want to learn how to Greco, do this first. It took me four months to be able to, to monster walk around that tr track without stopping. And it took yeah. about an hour. And then so when I was able to step up, step all the way around the track, 400 meters, I told him I could kind of do it. He came back out and saw me. He said, let me see if you can do it. Sure enough, I could do that. 
and it took about an hour, a little bit, a little bit over an hour to, to monster the wall, keep down it, and don't come up. You got to stay there down low the whole time. Wow. And then he told me, he says, come to the wrestling room tomorrow, which was the following day. And then he got me in a wrestling position, and I got automatically got in that position. He goes, now you can't get taken down. Now you see how Mike Van Arsdale can't be taken down. Mike and Van that Arsdale was, was one of the most gifted athletes I've ever seen in this sport. So oh, what, yeah. What an honor to be able to train with that guy. Oh, yeah, I was able to train with Mike. And so that's where all of a sudden I started, you know, training with those guys day in and day out. Like I said, I stopped punching and kicking just for three years, three and a half years, just to become a wrestler, to develop their mentality, walk, talk, understand it, understand the culture. The only thing my wife would not let me do is have cauliflower ears. She says, no, I don't want any cauliflower ears and stuff like that. So she made me wear, uh, I had to wear ear guards. But for the most part, that's why, that's where I started wrestling. So now when it was hard to take me down, it was hard to take me down because yeah. why I understood the training. And that's what I was saying to a lot of people. A lot of jiu-jitsu schools are great, but they aren't doing conditioning training for grappling or wrestling like you would get in a wrestling program, whether it be junior high school or elementary, junior high school, high school, college, Olympic level. Um, they're not doing that. You're not doing that training. There's no way you're doing it because the average guy is jiu-jitsu guy isn't doing that. No. Now, I know you grew up loving basketball, but do you ever wish you'd grown up wrestling instead because those sports are in the same season? Well, so so what I thought about, because my dad was a wrestler, even though he was almost 6'11 when he went to McClimates High School, wow. and I never thought about it that way uh, because I don't think so because I had fell in love with basketball and martial I had mar my, my real love affair was martial arts, and I, but I, that was my, I always felt that I was cheating on martial arts with basketball. Gotcha. There, was no, there was no martial art. There was, you know, we had Bruce Lee, we had, Jim West from the Wild Wild West. So we didn't really have a lot. Where could you take martial arts in the future? And it was that wasn't really there. And then so when we finally, when I finally got to college and got beat up in college and wanted to say, hey, I want to make, I want to be a professional world champion street fighter before UFC. This was in 1981. Um, that's when I saw that martial arts could go somewhere um, because you had the PK, WK, the karate tournaments and stuff like that. And I remember a year before, year and a half before UFC won, I was thinking I was tired of point karate. I was tired of kickboxing. I was wondering what is the fighting going to turn into? And eventually a year and a half later, the UFC comes up. So I would say I, I'm glad my life turned out the way it did because I developed the athleticism and developed training methods to keep my athleticism and make my striking stuff more dynamic. Uh, and the wrestling stuff I picked up because at the time I needed to pick it up because I was, after I picked up wrestling to this day, a lot of studios, a lot of gyms, you can't get wrestling like that anymore. Right. You don't have, you, you, you can't, if you want an MMA guy, either you either have that wrestling or you got to go to a jujitsu studio that maybe offers wrestling, but to have go to wrestling practice, to like, you, you know, I'd go to, I go to ASU wrestling practice every day and I sit there and watch, take notes, and then I had either one of the wrestlers, hey, man, um, you know, Steve Blackford, he passed away, or Eric Larkin, you know, er Eric Larkin was a national championship in Arizona. I say, coach, Eric, hey, hey, man, can you take me through that workout? Can you show me what you do? And I would do my own wrestling practices. I would wow. do it just like they do them. Uh, I would have a 100-pound a, a wrestling dummy that I'd take in there and wrestle with and drill with. Then I found a wrestling room that had the Adam Takedown dummy, and I'd stay on that. I would do three-minute rounds on that on, on an outside single, inside single, low-level single, high crotch, double leg, then put them together, chain wrestle. I was putting all that stuff together. So when I finally became a wrestler, uh, uh, developed the wrestling with time, became a wrestler, uh, and putting the punching and striking back together with that, like I said, the phone stopped ringing. That fight, when I fought my, the fight you mentioned last fight, that fight, I had, I had the flu. I hadn't fought in three or four years. Uh, hadn't done any sparring. Last time I put an arm bar in somebody was four years or three or four years later. Right. So they right. say, this fight came on. Uh, I think Shannon Rich called me and said, Hey man, there's a fight. I said, Hey man, yeah. I, I said, are you in shape? Yeah, man, I wasn't in shape for shit. I go, no, man. I'm just, uh, <laughs> Hey, how much they pay? He goes, oh man, you get eight thousand dollars for this. I said, really? Shoot, I could use the money. And I thought I had the guy. And, and what I what I was didn't realize is that about six months earlier in that same promotion, 
a guy in Texas had died. He got beat to death. Ooh. And so what happened, the state of Texas has stopped letting fights go where you can get grounded and pounded on because I wasn't hurt. Right. I was just I was just waiting. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold this guy. Hold, wait, hold it. Boom, boom, boom. And they had they they in Texas they started stopping fights early because it was right off the heels of that guy getting killed in the ring. I said, dude, that I mean, sense. so that was kind of like all of a sudden you try to do like the Gracies, which is let them ground and pound or let them let them hit you until they tire out, and then you can kind of do your thing with it. But they stopped fight. They stopping fights early. Wow. So when Richard Blake fought me, he got that win. I was pissed. But then he wound up losing. He went 0 and 10 after that. Now, tell our audience where you're teaching now if they wanted to come train. I know you've got a dojo you run with your wife. Where is that? So we run, we live in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, but our studio, we own a title boxing club franchise. And one of the unique things about our title boxing club franchise, we run our my signature program. We were title boxing before title boxing. Uh, over twenty, uh, over thirty years ago, the program that title boxing, the business model they have, the business model is actually a business model that my wife and I helped start thirty years ago uh, in California, and then we brought that workout to Arizona. So we teach a boxing, kickboxing workout. It's a fitness workout, but then we teach some ancillary programs that teach some that has elements of MMA and boxing, and kickboxing. So we're on Thirty Second Street in uh, Indian School in Phoenix, Arizona. So it's a title boxing club Arcadia. For, it's called Title Boxing Club Arcadia. Very cool. All right. So you've been able to make a life through martial arts. That's uh, that's inspiring. Yeah, 100%. we're 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 big fans of your career. We're really excited. We were able to get you on for part two. And uh, throughout your career, man, nobody can say you ever showed fear. All you have to, you don't have to look any farther than this. One of your biggest struggles was asthma, and you fought how many times at altitude in Colorado? That that might be the most impressive thing on your resume from my perspective. Well, here's something that the people got to know is that I haven't finished. I've all, I've been training now and I'm planning to return to MMA because, really? fought, oh yeah, uh, and, and turn back to fight. And that was always the goal was to get to a point to where I say, okay, what am I really teaching? What is MMA? What is it about for me? And it goes back to my college days. Is it what's the difference between good and greatness? I played and get played with Maya Jackson, Byron Scott, Kobe Bryant, all of those guys. And one of the things that I always believed in martial arts, it was designed for personal development. And one of the things I said, what great the difference between good and greatness is simply greatness is not what you do, what you overcome. And to overcome all the difficulties, all the shortcomings of my career, um, all the things that I've, I, I've shared with, it was it, like Rocky says in, uh, uh, in in Balboa. There's some stuff that's left in in the basement. In the I haven't basement. got out. There's something left in the basement. I haven't got out. So, like I said, I never said, "Hey, I'm done with MMA." I never said one day I'm done with MMA. The phone started ringing, and it was it was Chuck Liddell who gave me the greatest piece of advice. And he was said, I said, Chuck, what should I do? And this was back in 04, 05, I think it was. Um, and Chuck says, Zane, I'd wait. I says, why? He says, the UFC is going to blow up one day, and the comeback story is going to be better than a, 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 a beginning story. And that's kind of what I've been waiting for. Now there's full circle. Uh, you've got these celebrity boxing matches. you got all these guys coming out and fighting now. Um, so there was some, there's some opportunities that now we can take advantage for uh, that I don't need to – I don't need to – uh, you can put stuff online and say, hey, I'm ready to go. So that's the plan is to come back. So we'll probably be back talking about, okay, we had this conversation uh, in your first interview. Now you've returned and come back. Okay, wow. Let me, here's part two of that story. Well, you know how to get a hold of us, and we now owe you a favor. So when it's time to get the word out, when you know what you're going to be doing, you give me a call and we'll have us another talk. Sounds great for sure. All right. Great talking to you, Zane. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.